the sun is somewhere under the bell there this morning. You can see some light effect on the lake. Lots of cloud. We'll come back here again, God willing. I'm taking you in a different spot today for a couple of reasons. Maybe you can guess why. Today is Palm Sunday. And our gardener actually cut some palm branches for our mess today. So we have real palm branches. We wouldn't have too many of those in Ireland for Palm Sunday. And then we have the olives, <coughs> especially at the Mount of Olives. They'll be using olive branches today in Jerusalem for the Palm Sunday procession from Bethphage in the afternoon all the way to St. Anna's Church, uh, which is probably our, the closest uh, church we have to the Temple Mount area to represent then Jesus coming from Bethphage, which is between Bethany and Jerusalem on the top of the Mount of Olives. <coughs> and heading then from there to down the Mount of Olives, across the Kedron Valley by Gethsemane, and over uh, up to, through the Zion Gate to the Church of St. Anna, where the pilgrims then will conclude the, the uh, procession and it's a beautiful occasion in Jerusalem every year. This year I'm going to miss it. It's a, a time when Christians of many different confessions are together on the streets and the Palestinian boys have a band and girls. And they're uh, a pipe band. And I think this comes especially from the time of the English um, mandate for Palestine, they had um, brought a lot of that culture here, the Boy Scouts, the Scout Band, that's what it is. And so they, they dress up like the Scouts you'd see anywhere in the world. And they have their, their musical instruments, and it's a great training and, and uh, exercise and development for these children, for the families that are involved hundreds of people involved, it's very, very beautiful, and thousands of people participate in the, in the, in the parade, in the procession. And it's a special moment also in Jerusalem because obviously the Christian population is a very small minority, and the police uh, make sure that the whole, the route of the procession, which normally with the pilgrimage season in full swing would be then packed with thousands of, of people. So as we came up there through the Benefactors Avenue here at Magdala, you saw all the palm trees. And you might ask, well, why were they waving palm branches for Jesus? And this morning I heard the commentary of uh, Tim Gray on the Amen app about the, the daily readings. And he talked about something that I hadn't realized. You know, we learn something every day. And if you look at these coins, people sometimes suggest that is, they ask a question based on this here, and they see the, the menorah, the oldest menorah, and then they say, okay, what's back here? And in the, in the coin, and they say, is that a menorah? Well, actually, it's not. It's a palm tree. Look, it has all those branches, but there's too many for a menorah, even for a Hanukkah, which is the one for Hanukkah before Christmas with the extra branches. So that's a palm tree. Now, why is the palm tree a common symbol in Jewish coins? And sometimes there was interpretation of these colonnades as palm trees also inside the arches. One of the challenges with art is to interpret and discover what the artist intended to express. And sometimes we don't, uh, the artist isn't around, especially 
there's less chance of meeting the artist if that piece of Magdala stone was done 2,000 years ago. But anyway, palm branches, why? Well, it turns out that when Judas Maccabeus threw off the Hellenization of, of uh, Jerusalem uh, after the, in the Hellenic period when they brought in the Olympic Games to Jerusalem and they covered up their circumcision mark and they defiled the temple, then, and Judas Maccabeus had the great victory and rededicated the temple, which is actually the source of the Feast of Hanukkah. Uh, they came into the temple waving palm branches. And something I think we commented when we were doing the series on the Twelve Apostles, but uh, Tim brought it out this morning, is that the two, the two of Jesus' twelve disciples are called Judas. Judas, the one who betrayed him, and then Judas Thaddeus, who is called St. Jude in English. And the fact is that if you have two of the twelve are called, called Judas, it means there's a great patriotic sense in that name and a great sense of uh, appreciation. And Judas Maccabeus would still be a great hero. And the palm branches, I was very familiar to the people. And then there's another very interesting fact that Tim brought out. And afterwards, I just looked up a little bit more about it. And it's like, why did they take off their clothes and place them on the road before Jesus as he's going along with his donkey? I always felt that a little bit strange. And actually, today I've learned why. And the reason is, you remember King Ahab? and his wife Jezebel. And that's the whole story of the prophet Elijah. And she was a Sidonian, I think, and she, she brought in the worship of the Baals into God's people. And Ahab actually is appreciated by secular Jewish history as a very successful king. He was um, militarily and uh, business-wise, trade-wise, very successful. It was a very prosperous time for the people, but then they went straight into false worship. It's interesting how in times of prosperity, we can easily tend to rule the roost and be kings in our own terms and ditch God. When we're in times of need, we become a bit more humble and our hearts open up more for God. So the people take off their jackets and throw them on the street. Well, why? Well, anyway, when Ahab's time is up, who takes over? Well, it's King Jehu. And actually, it's an interesting question. I wonder if King Jehu was from the line of David himself because he was the commander of the army under Ahab. So it's a very prosperous time. You think of a very prosperous country with a very powerful military force and economy. And the head of the military then has a lot of power. Well, he's the one who takes over after Ahab. And he actually eliminates Ahab's uh, children. He has himself crowned secretly. He closes off the city of Jezreel so that Ahab's family doesn't find out that he's being crowned and be prepared. And as soon as he's crowned, then he heads over there and he neutralizes the sons of Ahab, wipes them off the map and any other loyal supporters of King Ahab. And then he goes after Jezebel and, and she's killed. And so he restores worship. So he's a, a figure that was, you know, esteemed for restoring religious, pure religious worship in fidelity to the one God. And obviously he did it with that violence, right? As well. But he himself also didn't, didn't uh, really reform completely because you still have the big division of God's people in the Northern Kingdom and the Northern worship and so on. So instead of the one temple in Jerusalem. So the fact is, when he was made king, what did the people do? They took off their coats and put them down on the road in front of him. And what was that showing? We're submitting to you. 
We are submitting to you. We are declaring you as king. And so these two practices of the palm branches and the clothes on the road are historical memories of the people and they become symbols of how to recognize Jesus' kingship. I mean, you have to remember that all the disciples of Jesus are mostly Galileans and they don't have an army. Rome is in charge of the army <coughs> and Herod. Herod has his own troops to protect him and his own forces, his own militias. And I'm sure the high priests do as well because they send some of them to arrest Jesus at Gethsemane. So what do the Galileans have? They just have their coats and palm branches. And so they use that to express and celebrate Jesus publicly in Jerusalem, coming down the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem, waving their palm branches and putting their clothes on the road in front of Jesus. So it's a very clear proclamation that Jesus is king. Now there are big differences, both in the case of Jehu and of Maccabee, the, Judas, the Maccabees. Their dominion was imposed by the sword and by violence. And that's very interesting because today we're going to read that passage of the Gospel of the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, but it's going to be followed when we get to the normal Gospel reading of the day after the first reading from Isaiah, which is so moving, and also the second reading, which are two readings that get us focused on the core of Jesus' story. He's not coming with swords. And he's not going to execute the enemies of God and the enemies of true worship. He doesn't kill them and have their body thrown to the dogs like Jezebel. That's not Jesus. It's a whole different approach. He is going to be the victim. And we can find that right away in the readings of the of the day. So just let's look at them for a second. The Lord God, and as I say at chapter 50, has given me a well-trained tongue that I might know how to speak to the weary a word that will rouse them. And Jesus does that during the Passion on the way of the cross. Women do not cry for me. He comforts them. He comforts the man crucified with him on the cross, a parallel beside him. Today you'll be with me in paradise. He speaks a word to the weary, right from the misery that he's been put into. Morning after morning he opens my ear that I may hear, and I have not rebelled or turned back. I gave my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who plucked my beard, my face I did not shield from buffets and spitting. I actually have experienced spitting in Jerusalem. Religiously motivated spitting. You won't need to go into more details, but it's pretty ugly. And so, instead of Jehu and Maccabees' sword power to come in and reclaim the dignity of God, and of true worship and of the human being. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem is coming in for the passion. And many of the people who are celebrating him victoriously on this day coming into Jerusalem really love him and they know him and they know his humility and meekness, they know his rectitude and honesty, uh, that he's not a corrupted leader, that he's uh, leading by pure example by looking after the needy, the poor, instructing the ignorant, lifting up, proclaiming a kingdom of forgiveness, mercy, reconciliation, not violence, not destruction.
And on the other hand, they probably want him to throw out all the leadership that's there, that's corrupt. They still have a lot to learn. They, we all have to go through the passion to discover the truth of the way of humility, the power of humility. We have to be shaped by the brutality of the suffering of life, that our hearts open into that humility. The Lord God is my help, therefore I am not disgraced. I have set my face like flint, knowing that I shall not be put to shame. This is such a powerful text. I just thought I saw a piece of flint there I could pick up for you. <clears throat> we have mostly limestone here in Mount Arbel, but there's a lot of flint rock. In fact, I think some of this black rock here might be flint as its volcanic region. Flint is very hard rock. You make fire with flint. And then if we go forward, we have the Psalm 22, the Psalm of suffering. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? They all scoff at me, they mock me with parted lips. And then we go forward into the Philippians in Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, he wasn't just a leader of the Maccabees or the head of the army, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped at and torn from others. Rather, he emptied himself, took the, taking the form of a slave. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death on a cross. <coughs> so there's where we are. And then we have the whole reading of the palm, the Passion, uh, Passion Sunday. I hope you can go to church today to be with God's people as we celebrate Palm Sunday and enter into the mystery of, of Christ and that you make a good resolution today to make time on this Sunday and other days during Holy Week that you will spend time with Jesus. We need time with Jesus, uh, with him and his suffering and passion, not to get depressed, would actually to bring light into a very broken world that has so much suffering, so much frustration, so much violence, so much dysfunctionality, so much breakdown of family relationships where love is the dream and the expectation, but many times not the reality of day-to-day -day hardships. And this life of difficulties is filled with the gospel message of a path of salvation. And while we don't see the sun rising, we know it's there. And that light is giving us the possibility to see and understand our world. And it's giving us the warmth to feed us through the food that's processed through all the chlorophyll here all across our planet, our green planet Earth. And so our soul is nourished with the gospel today for the battle and the challenges and the hardships that we have to go through in our lives. May you be blessed and consoled and strengthened and think of the people you might have also dealt harshly with and think of the people who dealt harshly with you and open up paths of re pathways of reconciliation and and renewal for humanity god bless you today have a, a wonderful um, fruitful spiritually fruitful palm sunday see you later